Oh my god. Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Laurie has insulted me before we've even started. She said no. to me as we started, she said, I will not I don't know if I'll be able to understand the Australian accent. Do you think I sound Australian, Laurie? Uh, no, maybe not. I, I'm not so used to this. But... Okay. Where do you think I, where do you think I might be from? No, uh, I think you are living in Australia. But, I am living uh, maybe... in Australia, but I'm not Australian. Okay, maybe something like uh, Irish or... Voila, ah. well done. Ah. Very good. Uh, good it's, guess. It's not <laughs> an easy one as well for, for non-native uh, English people. <laughs> No, it's okay. I uh, sometimes have meetings to people in the USA and after about 20 minutes, they're like, hey, man, you don't sound Australian. You sound like you're from Ireland. And I'm like, that's because I am. (laughs) 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 Uh, Laurie, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here today uh, to have a bit of a chat about your paper um, that caught my eye a few months ago. But before we delve into your research, it might be good to uh, get a bit of background about you. So, Laurie, do you want to tell people um, where you are at the moment and a little bit of background about yourself and maybe kind of where you went to school and what you did and what led you to your career? Mm -hmm. Uh, So currently I live in France in Colmar, which is a small city uh, on the east side of uh, France, close to the border to Germany and Switzerland. Um, I, actually, I come from Lyon, which is more a bigger city, uh, where I studied uh, biology. Uh, so I did a, a bachelor in biology and then a master in neuroscience. And actually, it's during a Erasmus program in, in Vienna where I first discovered the sleep field. So it was a course about uh, sleep and chronobiology, which I found really interesting and it was a bit, yeah, it, it was a bit the beginning of, of this. Uh, it was quite a new new science, not that, yeah. So for me, it was really interesting to see that there is so much uh, still to discover in this field. And uh, yeah, it was a big discovery for me. Um, and during this uh, Erasmus program, I had to do um, a master project, and uh, I had the opportunity to do this uh, in in the field uh, of of, of uh, sleep. Uh, so we looked at um, at the effects of uh, the menstrual cycle on uh, the body temperature during the sleep. So it was my first um, step inside, and I found it really interesting. And when I went back to France, um, I, I I searched for a master project for for finishing my master degree, and I had the opportunity to work with uh, Karin Spiegel, which is um, a researcher specialized in um, in obesity, so metabolic uh, health and and sleep. So during my master project, we looked at the impact of uh, extending the sleep of short sleepers, which were overrated. And we looked at different um, effects on the metabolism and on the food intake and so on. And I, I found it really interesting. Excellent. And, and, yeah. and, and where, where do you work today, Laurie? Where, where are you working? Uh, today, so I'm in a private company, uh, which is developing a medical device to measure sleep, which oh, is called Somnoart. So oh, I'm, sorry, I'm, what's, it called, what's it called? Somnoart. Somnoart. The, the device, yeah. Oh, so I, I, I'm staying in the in the sleep uh, science, but more on the on the other side. On the, um, yeah, I'm I'm still doing uh, research and development, but yeah, it's, it's more applicated. And yeah, my my PhD. I had the opportunity to to have this um, PhD uh, um, grant uh, in Switzerland. Um, so it's the lab of Christian Kajorn, yep. who so he collaborated with a different um, lab. Um, yeah. Um, so actually, it's it's a it was a national grant from the Ministry of Environment of Switzerland who asked actually different uh, laboratories to work on this project. And the idea was to have a better look on the, um, on the noise uh, impacts, so traffic noise on health, uh, on, on short term and on long term. So they were our lab looking really on the acute effect of the noise. 
And then we had um, uh, collaborators who looked at more long-term like epidemiological studies um, on the effect on the health. So yeah. Excellent. That's... And so what what um when you were growing up and going to school, uh did you say you went to school in Leon? Yes. In Leon. Do you know about 23 years ago I was backpacking in France and I was going from I think Paris no Strasbourg to Marseille I think maybe it was and we stopped in Lyon at the nice. train station and I had the best slice of pizza I ever had in my life because I was so <laughs> hungry and had no money <laughs> <laughs> maybe why it was so good <laughs> it's so good and I always remember that yeah getting on um getting getting off that train in Lyon and then um yeah having that pizza I was like I was so hungry because I'd eaten since breakfast and it was like 10 hours of food so I, every time I think of Lyon I just think of the of the pizza that I had there yeah. Yeah. And, I, and if I say it to my wife if I say it to my wife when she comes home from work this evening Lyon she'll go oh pizza that's what she'll say <laughs> Yeah, and Leo is it's like a, a big city of food, but not for pizza. It's not for more, pizza. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not in the train station. <laughs> Fine. Actually, I live not so far away from Strasbourg. It's uh, like one hour um, train from down, so south from Strasbourg. I, I, Colmar is uh, not so far away from... Oh, yeah. From... Very, very interesting city, Strasbourg. Kind of was part of Germany, part of France, part of Germany, part of France, back and forth. Mm. Well, like five kilometers from Germany, really? Yes, yeah. it's something like that, yes. Yeah. Mm. Really Be beautiful, big Gothic church in uh, yeah. Strasbourg. Mm -hmm. We went to go see. I remember that, yeah. A beautiful yeah. church, yeah. Very, very mm. nice, yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have this mix of of uh, culture on on the border. So when I was in Basel, it's a bit the same. You have the the three countries really close uh, by, and you you yeah. always jump from one to the other. It's it's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's the great mm -hmm. thing about Europe. Like uh, everything is so close, and mm -hmm. um, everything is so different. Here in Australia, it's like five hours to fly across the country, but it's really the same. People think it's different. I just think it's mm -hmm. kind of the same, but. Whereas in mm. Europe, you know, you, you drive 20 minutes and it's like a different world, you know, like yeah. uh, I, I have a friend from he's, he's, he's Dutch and um, he lived on the border between Germany and Holland and he would go basically for a run in the evening. But like, you know, he'd run into Germany and then run back. That was just the best running route. And people are like, what? You'd run to Germany and back? <laughs> like, they just mm. don't get, they don't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> so, was, yeah. so yeah. hey, Laurie, when you were growing up, uh, what did you want to do? Did you like, you know, when you were like maybe 13, 14 years of age or high school, did you want to be a sleep scientist or what was mm. your dream? Did you want to be, I don't know, a, a, an actor, an acrobat, a pilot? What did you want to do mm. when you grew up? Was this always the thing you wanted to do? I, when I was really small, I, I wanted to be a cook. I really liked yeah. eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So do I. <laughs> so I was, I was always interested about food and yeah, so it was more this, but yeah, I thought that's, I also love to sleep, and I know that uh, the, the, <laughs> the the skills of the the cookers is not so easy. That you have to work in the evening and so on. That, yeah, but still, yeah. Actually, after my my PhD, I I did um, um, a course uh, on dietitian. So yep. I graduated as a dietitian, and actually, it, it I came a bit back to to the cook part. So it's a big <laughs> a, a nice uh, mix of science and and food actually so i found uh, this solution <laughs> to find a mix of well, this. well i think it's an interesting area because the whole area of dietetics slash nutrition and sleep is a new emerging field like um you know you got people like charlotte gupta down here in australia at central queensland university who's doing some work around chrono nutrition um, and this is a very interesting thing. And she's spoken um, at our seminar last year for Sleep for Performance on this. And that's free on YouTube if anybody wants to go and watch that talk. But this area of chronic nutrition is definitely one that's growing. So it's a great it's a great addition, I think, and something to look at uh, going forward because we know there's these relationships between uh, poor sleep, increase mm -hmm. in body mass, more prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the biggest things we can do to lessen that is obviously to reduce body weight um, which then reduce risk for diabetes or any other metabolic condition or, or obstructive sleep apnea. So I think it's a it's a nice combination you have there. Yeah, it, it quite, was quite a bit cool. the idea. Yeah. yeah, with my background with Karen Schwieg and so on, I already worked on this uh, link between the two, and I find it so interesting. And so many people are not aware about that that you have yeah. an impact on your sleep, and that the sleep has an impact on your weight. And 
I think yeah, it's important also to to do more prevention or to inform mm. people about that. And yeah, mm. yeah, I think particularly for people working odd hours, shift workers in mm. factories, yeah. mining, aviation, this uh, desynchronization or deregulation of their you know of their of their body clock you know affects the leptin and ghrelin levels, which are these appetite regulating hormones, which then basically make us at two or three o'clock in the morning crave french fries burgers pizza uh, mm -hmm. all these type of foods we never want to crave a salad at two or three o'clock in the morning so it can be very difficult for for people working shift work at these times so yeah definitely um definitely an area for 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 further research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, let's have a look at your study, this paper, which was uh, published in Environment International, which is called Adverse Impact of an Nocturnal Transportation Noise on Glucose Regulation in Healthy Young Adults. So this was um, where you had looked at multiple different things in here. Um, so, um, yeah, like, maybe we'll start with like kind of the introduction and background. Why, why did you do this study? And then we'll jump into the methods and results. So actually, it's yeah. Uh, uh, as I explained before, it's actually the um, the government of of Switzerland who wanted to uh, deep more in the in the um, in the science of the impact of the traffic noise on on health because a lot of uh, epidemiological studies uh, found a link uh, or association between uh, the expose the, the exposure to this kind of noise during and particularly during sleep and uh, an increased uh, risk of diabetes, uh, obesity, cardiovascular diseases. And um, yeah, the idea was to look more uh, on, on short time, so on ac more acute effects, how, how really this, the, during sleep, how the noise uh, impact maybe sleep or, or, the, or the system and how this can then on long term uh, lead to this um, to this uh, metabolic uh, diseases. So we so we, at at, uh, at the chronobiology lab, uh, actually it's it's a lab more used to do con uh, constant routine or really um, so it's a, like a bunker. So you have uh, rooms without windows. Um, everything mm -hmm. is completely controlled. Um, and so we had uh, participants who came for six days in the lab. Um, and so on the first and the last night, it was um, a baseline and a recovery night. So they were, they were only a um, background noise. Um, like if you have a, a window open um, uh, with a tilted window, you have like a background noise. And during the four nights in between, we, we played uh, back uh, traffic noise that has that has been uh, recorded in the field so it was the real noise that people yeah. get um and we so here we were not interested really on the level of the noise so all the the four nights had the same uh, mean level of noise which was 45 uh, db but we were um, interested of the eventfulness of the noise so um a train which come each i don't know 10 minutes have a high eventfulness compared to a highway where you have like a constant noise and we wanted to see if you have different impacts of the kind of noise uh, between these two so so, so um, Laurie, just just to clarify that is it fair to say that the noise conditions one was intermittent noise that would happen every now and then and then the other one was like a sustained noise that was just constant throughout the night yeah, we had four yeah. noise scenarios. Okay. Uh, so there were three noise uh, from the road noise. So with uh, low intermittency, uh, mi middle and high intermittency. So low was highway, then uh, road, uh, what, what is the name? Um, lane country uh, road. And then um, yeah. like, uh, yeah, what was the last one? Uh, urban road that you have like a, a noise uh, coming that you really hear compared to the background noise. And then you had the, the train uh, scenario. Um, and in, in so we were two uh, PhD students on this project. My colleague was more focused on really the, the effect on the sleep structure, microstructure with the spindles uh, and so on. And I was more in charge of the cardiovascular system. So. Uh, here in this paper, we focused on the glucose uh, response to that, but then we also looked at uh, the stress response uh, with the 
different hormones and the heart rate, how, how the heart rate and so on uh, respond to that. But here it was um, specific to the glucose uh, system. So we had an um, uh, oral glucose tolerance test that we did after the baseline nights. And then we compared this to the last noise night. So after the four nights of traffic noise. And a last one was done uh, after the recovery nights to see if we had a, a difference in the glucose response after the baseline, the four nights uh, of traffic noise and the, and the recovery. And what we found uh, was that indeed we, we saw um, an increase, so uh, a decrease of the glucose tolerance and a, a decrease of the insulin sensitivity. So it means that uh, yeah, the, the system was impaired after the, the four noise, um, noise nights. What I think is really interesting about this study, if we just hang on the methods for a minute, because it's, it's worth understanding how good this study is in terms of its design. A lot of times in sleep, it's very difficult for us to get measures of sleep. And this was a very robust study. And I just think it's worth highlighting that here. Um, you know, you've got multiple questionnaires here, PSQI, which is sleep quality, daytime sleepiness, chronotype questionnaires, and uh, noise sensitivity, and so on. So there's this real nice way of, I suppose, characterizing the sample. Um, of 20, I think you had 21 participants in total, but it's a really nice way of characterizing them. So whilst the numbers may be low compared to other studies, it is very, very in-depth and a very well-structured um, um, study. And so it's worth just highlighting some of the things in this paper. Um, not only have you outlined the experimental design in terms of what was happening and noise characteristics, but you also spoke there about the glucose metabolism, which was taken from blood samples, um, so you get that, got to take a blood assays for this for the for the glucose and the insulin response. And um, there's other sleep measurements here that are going on using sleep evaluation questionnaires. There's also polysomnography, which is like the top level of of sleep method me measurement as well. So this is an an excellent study in terms of its design. So and a very not a very not a cheap study either. This is a this oh. is a difficult study to run, a very expensive. And mm. so um, I think in terms of the design. Uh, it's great that you got the funding for this because that that is a that is a high cost study. So it's great that you got mm. the funding, um, but also as well, did 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 were the subjects kept in the laboratory during the day as well, or could they go and work and do other things? No, it, it was quite a a difficult um, protocol. So yeah, we as you said, we assessed a lot of of data. We wanted to be the more controlled as possible to be sure to really see the effect of the noise and not. Uh, the impact of maybe the light exposure or maybe what they do during the day and so on. So they had to stay in the lab during the six days. So it was in, in the in the room. So yeah, it was quite tough for them. Um, so also also for the recruitment, it was not so easy because we had a lot of, of parameters. We wanted to have really healthy participants with a good uh, hearing capability and and no other uh, cofactor that could in, impact the, the data. And they had to be OK to stay uh, six days in the lab uh, without doing. So they were not allowed to have the, the smartphone or internet. So they, they, <laughs> yeah, they, were, they were painting, um, playing music, uh, a lot of stuff. But yeah, they were a bit um, close to the, to the real world during six days. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's an interesting observation in itself. Like, because do you think that potentially, when we remove smartphones and this connection to the outside world, that we may even get better sleep? Maybe <laughs> that was not the, the goal of this uh, study, but uh, on the other side, maybe you have also like uh, anxiousness that uh, you have no no information about your family. You can also have the other. Yes. Effect. That's, so that's de definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. So it could, it could, it could go, it could go both ways. Couldn't it? It could actually make them feel very relaxed or make them feel very stressed. Mm. Yeah. 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 And also yeah, the, this, um, this glucose test was also quite a, a big uh, test. So we, we, we put a catheter in the morning and it was during two hours that we took blood from, from, from the participants. So that was also one aspect that uh, could uh, refrain some of the participants um, to, to have this kind of, of uh, situation. 
But yeah, at the end we had, uh, so in, th in this study we have 26 young participants and uh, 16 older ones who participated to study. But in, in the one, in the paper that you mentioned, we looked only on the on the younger one because we are not finished with the, with the older group. So you had them broken into different groups. So you had the control group, you yes. had the, um, the first group was called the, uh, there's lots in this paper, the less eventful group, the LE group. Uh, you had the more eventful group, and then you did obviously comparisons between those. You had three groups, the control group, the LE group, and yeah. the um, more eventful group. Yeah. Uh, if I stumble, it's just so much information in this paper, and I've read it a couple of times, and I'm still like, wow, there's more I keep seeing every time. <laughs> um, so the control group, just to give people an idea in terms of sleep that people were getting, uh, actually quite good sleepers, if you look at, even just um, night one, five, and six as samples, which is the the baseline and the recovery at the end as well, uh, over seven hours. So four hundred thirty seven minutes, four hundred thirty nine minutes. So your seven hours is four hundred and twenty minutes. So you're over sort of that seven to nine hour range, perfect. Um, and then people in the uh, less eventful group were up around four hundred forty eight minutes. So yeah, you're looking at like seven and a half hours here. And then the same as well with the more eventful group as well. So overall, very good sleepers, high sleep efficiency up to 90%. Sleep latency is uh, quite low, down sort of between 19 to 30 minutes. So all within clinical norms, sleep architecture looked all really good as well, um, and so on. So and a very data-rich uh, paper, and then all the subjective sleep quality in here as well. So, so, so really... Laurie, when I look at this, like there's obviously some differences in the sleep latencies. Um, and whilst they might be statistically significant, they're not really clinically relevant, I don't think. Mm -hmm. There's no like there's no like we don't have we don't have people taking like two hours to fall asleep and other people taking mm -hmm. ten minutes. So statistical differences, but not big clinical relevance there. Um what what's your kind of summary of the of the sleep overall in terms of the effect of the traffic noise in the background mm. yeah actually maybe it's one of um of the limit of the study we so we we recruited them to be really good sleepers and maybe they were too good sleepers <laughs> yeah yeah and so on the macro structure we couldn't see any changes so they slept uh, well so actually yeah we, we found this uh, increase in sleep latency but we also found it in the control group so maybe it's more an effect of the lab that they stayed in lab in the lab during uh, six days more than really the noise had that uh, impacts the sleep latency. Um, what we found was a small increase in the cortical arousals, so two arousals more per hour, but it's quite small. Um, and um, my colleague who works on the on the spindle could see a decrease of the amplitude of the of the spindles, but so maybe it was more um the yeah the effect of the noise who decreased like in, in instability of the, of the spindles but yeah actually we were quite surprised to see really few effects on the on the sleep uh, level so yeah at the beginning we were a bit surprised and um yeah. as phd students uh, a bit uh, <laughs> um yeah that it could be a problem also for our work but yeah on the other side what was interesting is that we could see that the uh, autonomic arousals, so the cardiac arousals, increased um, during during the noise nights. So, yeah, the, the final conclusion would be more that we had more uh, um, uh, metabolic, so a, a deeper effect that didn't impact the sleep per se, but more, um, yeah, the the autonomic system. But yeah, maybe it's also because they were really healthy and really good sleepers. Yeah. The other thing as well is that the noise annoyance, which is subjective assessment, did oh. go up. Yeah. That's yeah. True, so yeah. The, the, there was that kind of um, annoyance oh. factor of the background noise, but didn't seem to really translate into the sleep on a, on a yeah. big scale, as you said. Was was anybody, um, I don't know, like pissed off during the day or annoyed? Did they, feel, did they feel like their sleep was really bad from the background noise? Were they getting irate and sort of angry or was... Or people okay. Um, you mean during the the noise the noise nights? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, what, what was first interesting is that also the control group who has all the time the, the first night noise, so like the background noise, they, because we told them that there will be traffic noise. And so I, they thought it was a traffic noise scenario and they felt more annoyed during the, uh, the normal traffic noise, but actually they always had the background noise. So it, it shows that you have also the psychology behind this, mm. that you think that it will annoy you. But actually, it, it was the same noise. So yeah, um, it, the, the response was quite uh, different between participants. So it was interesting that some we had, uh, for example, one older lady who tried to cope with the noise. And so do, she, she told us in the, on the next day that uh, when she heard the, the, the train coming, she was imagine, imagining that it was like a, a waterfall. And she tried to do like a positive um, uh, meta metaphor that she wa she wanted to to see it as a positive aspect, and so she she could deal quite good with this. Um, but yeah, no, they they told us that they they they, they heard the, the noise, but um, it was quite different between one to the other participants. So yeah, actually we had only two drop drop out who, who couldn't uh, finish the, the study until the end. And why, why did they drop out? Was it just, was it related to the study or something else? Were they just not sleeping well? Were they just not feeling good? Uh, the one told us it was because, um, uh, because actually they, they were allowed to have uh, contact to their family during one or two hours during the day. And um, the the grandfather was sick and was at oh, the hospital. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. He had to go, and the other was more um, the they couldn't uh, deal with the the stay in the lab during uh, so long time. So the, the six days were too long to. It was not really the noise. It was more the really the, the isolation. Stay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think I'd like to go to a lab for six days with no work. I would like it at this stage. It would be a nice, mm. I would welcome the break. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's a nice experience. We, yeah. we, we try to, to 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 give it like this, that they, it's a nice experience to do. They finally have time for them and do yeah. what they want to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that might be, that might be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so obviously this had an impact on the glucose and the insulin, as you said. Um, what would be the long-term effect let's say and i'm just trying to think about this in a practical term if somebody's living in an environment or they're working in a remote camp in mining oil and gas or they're in the military um, and they have this constant background noise um what would be the long-term effect do you think on people's health from this type of noise exposure um so the so what we found here with the glucose the long term effect would be the type two diabetes. So it's it's going to a uh, insulin resistance, which at term will lead to um, the system will be too too used, and at the end it, it can lead to type two diabetes. But yeah, we 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 it, it's a supposition. So we we don't have the data to yeah, show yeah. that we really have this effect. But it. As we see on the long term, so we see people living close to railway, railway, to 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 noise, to traffic noise. We see that they, there is more type two diabetes, so it it can be this effect. Um, yeah, some people think that they habituate to noise. That uh, when you are used to be close to noise, uh, your body will habituate and so on. But actually, what we so with this short term study. Um, what we saw is that actually uh, your, your sleep seems to maybe habituate so that that you your your cortical system will say okay I, I know this noise uh, I don't have to wake up um, I can continue to sleep but it's more on the on the autonomic system that you still have response to the noise that's on each uh, noise source, your, your cardiac system will activate and still have this stress response, which on the long term can have yeah different uh, impacts on, on the cardiovascular system. So it's more the impact of the noise on the cardiac system, the, cardio the cardiac system, and that's how it's impacting the insulin and the mm. glucose response, not so much on the sleep itself. 
Yeah, yeah, that's okay. that's uh, what what we we found. So we found a, a correlation between the the duration of the autonomic uh, arousals. So we had an increase, uh, yeah, of of cardiac response, and this was correlated with the increased uh, impairment in the glucose system. Mm. You wonder then, like in a kind of a negative cycle or negative spiral, mm -hmm. how that would affect other things, because obviously with those impact on glucose and insulin, you may start having issues with regulating your leptin and ghrelin. You may start making poor food choices, which mm. may lead to weight gain, which may yeah. lead to unhealthy behaviors, which may lead to poor sleep. And then you're just in this kind mm -hmm. of negative all the way mm. down. And so, yeah, whilst mm. the study was only six nights, um, yeah, it is interesting that it shows this because some of the other studies that have shown when you sleep deprived people during the week, um, and then try and catch it, catch up on sleep on the weekend. Those people display similar markers as well and end up being into this pre-diabetic stage over two or three weeks. So it just goes to show that I think this study and like a few other studies that when we do go to sleep or when we do make time for sleep, it's not just about the timing of the sleep, but it's about being in an environment that's conducive to good sleep. And we have to really think about these environments. And I've heard people say things like, um, and I've heard this as well, uh, reports of this, that people in New York, for example, they like the sound of the background noise, mm. you know, but you wonder how much of this is actually having an impact on people's stress responses or cardiac system, like you were saying, and their sleep, that just to get, like you say, habituate to and get used to it over time. But maybe it would be better off in a different type of sleeping environment. And I think stuff like this that you've looked at here is only going to get worse in developed countries because, you know, the cities are growing. There's more people, there's more noise, more roads, more railways. And so if you're kind of central to a city, this noise is just going to be like, poof, 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 poof. it's just going to be more and more. So, yeah. What do you think we can do to potentially mitigate this? and lessen this exposure to, to us as humans? Um, so the first thing is that um, some countries already um, controlled the, the air flight um, um, timing so that you have a, a calm down during the night. So this is the first thing that I think is good, even if also the day uh, noise has also an impact um, also on sleep so it's also a vicious uh, cycle that's uh, also during the day you can impair then uh, increase your stress and then impair your sleep but it's already a good thing that they try to to regulate the the the, the air the air traffic um then um yeah to have good uh, windows that uh, block the noise let's uh, try to 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 improve this on on the level of the country um, and then we also heard about a system that uh, tried to suppress the noise. So it's like a, a box who take the, the noise and try to, to filter it in one way. So okay. I, I heard about this during my thesis, so I don't know if it's still, um, if, it, if it's now on the, on the market, but uh, I found it a good idea. And then, yeah, airplugs are, I think it's also a good solution uh, when you are really, um, uh, in, uh, when when the noise is um, bothering you, uh, if you are yeah, if you have too much noise, which which could be the case if you're traveling for work. So lots of people travel mm. for work, and you might stay in a hotel or an apartment that may not mm. be you know very quiet. I I was just thinking as you were talking about maybe about four years ago, um, yeah, maybe, anyway, I go back and forth to the east coast of Australia quite a bit, which is about a four or five hour flight. And I was staying in Melbourne and I couldn't get a hotel near where I was working. So I rented an Airbnb apartment, but it was near a tram line. Mm. And from about five in the morning, you could just hear the tram dinging because it would ding its bell because uh. it was going through an intersection. And I was just going insane. Wow. This bell mm. was ringing. I was there for like two or three nights, but the tram wouldn't stop till like midnight or one o'clock, whatever it was. And it was just like ding, ding, ding every five minutes. And then I, I'm sure I was dreaming of the, thing in as well when I was asleep mm. but I came out of there and I was just I was my eyes were just hanging on my head my sleep was so like impacted from it I, f I felt like crap and I I said to the guy at the Airbnb I'll never stay here again I mm. said the place was nice but that noise drove me mm. insane 
every five minutes, ding, 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 three bells every five minutes, just like constantly waking me up. Yeah. That would drive me insane. So I can't imagine living in a place like that. I can't even yeah. imagine getting used to that. It would drive you crazy. Yeah, it's funny that some people can habituate or think they habituate to this. So when you are exposed to this all your life, I think you do like coping system to not hear the, the noise anymore. But yeah, as said, maybe still your, your body responds to it. Uh, even if you think that you you are you don't yeah do you, do you with some of your research laurie as well did you see any impact not maybe not just with this pro this this study itself but in your broader reading or connections is there any impact of age or or um or sex so like do females more more i don't know sensitive to men to noise or is it more like men over 40 get it or men under 50 like is there any sort of variables like that that would indicate that people are more prone to this so we, we looked uh, in our data at the end so we had uh, the these two uh, age groups and male and females and we couldn't see any differences so maybe because they were really good sleepers also the older yeah. one but uh, we had no differences uh yeah on the on this side so I, I don't know in the literature actually uh, what is uh, said uh, today, but uh, we couldn't see any differences. Excellent. Hey, Laurie, what sort of research are you working on now? What's your What's your next goal in terms of research that you're doing? Are you Are you looking to publish work coming up, or what What's your kind of current focus? Actually, I finished this thesis uh, five years ago. It's quite a long time ago. So I jumped in this um, in this company. So uh, actually, I'm working more on wearable devices and uh, trying to yeah to 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 have something more accessible um, um, as in a, a gap between actigraphy and polysomnography to have something okay. ambulatory yeah. um, to measure sleep. Yeah, so I'm more focused in this field today, but I'm still I'm, really interested in the in the link between um, food and uh, and sleep. So for me, it's a bit my 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 best topic. So I really like this topic. So I'm always looking at this and inform myself. Excellent. And um, will you be publishing any papers from that work you're doing with that company, or will it just be internal work reports? Uh, yes, I I already so we, we published uh, uh, three papers. Uh, so okay. we actually we 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 tried yes we we validated the system um, against polysomnography uh, in different um, groups. So in healthy subjects, in insomniacs, uh, apneic, and depressive people, and uh, we also did um, a multi 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 scorer study where we compare to ver various scores because we know the the big um, intervariability between scores so yeah so um, i worked on this and uh, we are looking to to find new subjects to to work on excellent yeah so i'm just looking at some of those papers now it obviously wasn't the focus of our topic um our topic of our conversation today but it might be an interesting Chandler there because um yeah this area of technology is always growing and I think it's yeah. um I think more people are kind of trying to move out laboratory based assessment so we do a lot of work in athletes and shift workers and you know you can't get people in to do PSG every single night yeah. if they're working on a remote oil and gas rig so yeah. using something like actigraphy is beneficial but then how do you assess mm -hmm. sleep disorders or sleep problems in a more clinical setting um as you go as you go through so yeah, this is uh this is interesting, these type of things. So I haven't been aware of this product before, Somno Art, but it would be um interesting to have a look at it probably after this after this chat. Yes. So this is really interesting work. It's true that uh, yeah, PSG is the gold standard, but you cannot do uh, multiple nights uh, recordings. It's really expensive. So we know all the limits of the PSG. Um and yeah, the the the, the, the good thing of this is yeah to have on on several nights uh, the recording and to have the sleep structure um and yeah on the market today you have so many devices coming up we every day we heard about a new one it's really yeah. exploding but on the other side you have really not a lot who are really validated against psg and uh, in a good um, structure so in a good uh, so yeah yeah it's it's not the, the smallest one, so you have devices which are even more portable, but uh, it's also the idea to have a better signal quality and, and to be able to really get the good signal to then uh, do uh, that the algorithm can can work on the on the PP on the PPG signal so on the heart rate signal. Yeah. 
Excellent. Well, listen, Laurie, thank you very much for coming on today and having a chat about your paper. This is an area that's developing, um, I think, even further. Um, we're doing some work on this uh, here in Australia as well um, on sleep environment and the impact of light, light mm -hmm. noise and its impact on sleep and shift workers. So it's definitely mm -hmm. an emerging area. And I think, Wanda, as you said at the start, this area is growing so much and in different directions, mm -hmm. the whole sleep world. I think it's brilliant. So there's so many things out there. So thank you so much again for coming on today. Um, if anybody wants to contact you, uh, do you have a website? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Instagram? Where can people find out more about your work? LinkedIn is good. Yeah. Um, Link LinkedIn is the easiest for me. <laughs> LinkedIn is easiest. All right. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you for the invitation. It was really nice talk. And uh, yeah. yeah. You too. It's as good well. that you do this kind of, of podcast also to to increase also the, the, the possibilities to hear about sleep and and the yeah. different aspects yeah thank you well it's it, it's great we've done over like 100 episodes and you know i know a lot of people are long time listeners too and enjoy it as well uh, the selfish part for me is i get to talk to many different people around the world i get to, I, to me it's like delving into some of these studies and having a chat because you go to conferences and it's five minutes here it's five minutes there or eat back and forth on email or you read a paper but this is a better way to kind of discuss people's work and then who knows it may lead to collaborations and future work down the line and i'm all, always interested in that as well so um you know I'm, I'm interested in creating networks and pumping out more work um i'm not interested in hiding away so yeah it's, it's great to chat to you great thank you very much <laughs> thanks laurie